Hey, thanks for checking out this week's video. It is the first of two parts where I show my entire process covering how I create mock-up references, transfer them to canvas, and then the final oil painting itself. So a quick note, I realized that I can't explain what's happening at the same time you see it in this video without it being a very long video. So I made a PDF. It takes you through the process, where to find the tools in Photoshop, how I use them, where in the reference you can see them being used. Uh, I hope that some of you will find it useful. If you are interested, the link is in the description box below. The first thing I always do once I found a photo that I want to use as a reference is I alter the model's face to make it a bit more alien-esque I guess. I love to exaggerate the proportions so generally I always look to make the eyes really big as well as the eyebrows and the forehead area and then generally I'll make the nose smaller and then mouth more narrow. This is all done in Photoshop. I do use an add-on called Lazy Nazumi and a Wacom tablet but they aren't essential to this process. All that's required is Photoshop. So I start by making a duplicate of the reference photo and then I take it into the liquify filter. This allows you to move, enlarge and decrease the size of areas without the image tearing. I wanted the side of her face to be sharper just to simplify the form. Making these changes in liquify can really warp parts of the face that you don't want to affect. This is why I duplicate the original layer so then I can apply a mask and just bring back the original features so they are no longer affected. Next I move on to enlarging the eyes. I select a larger area, and trust me, you do need the extra room, and then I copy and paste that again onto a new layer using Control and J as a shortcut. Then I reposition them where I think they should go, but you don't really know until you've finished masking it back in. So again, another layer mask to erase the outside area to blend it back in together. Now you might be wondering why I don't just completely erase it, but if you do that, then you actually delete all of the information of that layer and if you ever wanted to go back, you'd have to start from scratch, whereas with a mask, that information is still there, you can bring it back just as easily as you got rid of it. So this is pretty much the process until I'm happy with how it looks. If Liquify isn't giving you the results you want, try the copying and pasting with a mask. For example, some areas can be really tough to copy and paste as masking can reveal an area underneath that kind of messes everything up. A good example of this is I think when I'm doing the forehead, it's usually always the forehead that gets me because the hairline sort of creeps in on the side and then when you mask it out it shows through underneath. Sometimes you just have to sort of go with it, maybe even paint on top. You can actually also use the spot healing brush or the patch tool to sort of fix those areas if you need it. I'll cover that in the PDF because I don't actually show that in this video. A quick tip for the flowers, although it is the same process, I use the same image over and over again, but to avoid it looking obviously repeated, I, I think I flip it horizontally, maybe even vertically, and then I decrease the size as well. So just doing those small changes can make it look like new flowers rather than it being the same one over and over again. So at this point, you might be happy with your reference and that's fine, but I like to adjust the colors so that I have an exact reference, especially as I'm still learning to mix colors. So I like the reference to be perfect and then I can just worry about mixing it. So the first thing I do is I want to create a layer that is all the layers combined without actually combining them all. The shortcut for this is Control, Alt, Shift and E. It's quite a long one. I think for Mac, it's Command, Option, Shift and E. And like I said, this will create a new layer at the very top that is as if you've just flattened the whole thing. Oh, and this generally is quite a good time to start grouping up all your old layers to, I mean, I go crazy with my layers. I have so many, so you'll often see me adding them to new groups just to try and keep it somewhat tidy. I, I really like to hoard my layers. I don't like to delete them until I know everything's perfect. So there are two ways to adjust colors that I use. Either the hue and saturation menu, which is Control U or Command and U if you're on a Mac, or the levels, which is Control L and I guess it would be Command L for the Mac. I find the hue and saturation one just to be the most straightforward. You'll see me use it on the flowers. I change the hue, focusing on the color of them only. The skin looks awful, I know, but I mask that out later. 
Another important step that I do is creating a new layer filled with one single colour and set to soft light on a low opacity. This helps to unify all the elements so they actually look like they're the same photo rather than being Frankenstein together. Don't worry about what colour it is that you fill it with, I just, I think I used an eyedropper and selected her skin tone and then filled the layer with that first. Then once you've changed the layer mode to soft light and reduced the opacity, you can open that hue and saturation menu again and just have a look through all the different colours and find one that you prefer personally. Don't forget you can always mask out areas if you don't want them affected by the new colour. Or you can even do a gentle mask by using grey to paint on the layer instead of just black or white. That way it will, it's like having a low opacity. So you can create some areas that are very strongly affected by the new colour and some that are just very faintly tinted. Once the mock-up is finished, you can either work from it by eye, use a grid to copy it or trace it. Just a quick note to say, don't feel bad about tracing. <laughs> I think there's so much pressure, especially with younger or new artists, that they think they need to take the most difficult and longest route in order to be classed as an artist. You don't. You really don't. Tracing is only bad if you're stealing someone's work, you don't have permission to use the photo, for example it's copyrighted, or, and I guess this is where the grey area is, if you use it as an excuse not to learn the fundamentals. If you rely on tracing, it can really slow down your learning progress. But that doesn't mean to say you can't use it, just in moderation. I think if you're using it as an excuse not to do the hard work so that you can do it without tracing, that's when it's a problem. But otherwise, do not feel bad about it. It's something that doesn't happen overnight and beating yourself up over it is not going to increase your ability to do it perfectly without any aid anytime soon. I don't have much time to work on my art as I'm a full-time mother of a young child, so in this case I opted to trace so that I can focus on my painting application and techniques as that's where I want to improve right now. So to start lining the work, I create a new layer that is a combination of all the layers, again using that Alt, Control, Shift and E. Then I lower the opacity of that layer so I can create a new layer on top and sketch fairly easily and still see underneath. Once it's ready, I print it out to the correct size and start scribbling on the back. You might be thinking, why are you scribbling on the back? This is how I transfer it to the canvas. So basically, I am using a really soft pencil. I think it's a 5B. And I scribble across the whole of the lines on the back in one direction. And then I'll flip it and cross the other way. So you're essentially cross hatching across all the back of the lines. You really want to fill the area with a lot of graphite so that it's easier to transfer. Oh, and you'll see an appearance from my cat Gigi. He's obsessed, well, he's not only obsessed with art supplies, but scratching, scratching sounds, anything that is scratchy. And since I'm scribbling away with his pencil, he came running in and then he didn't want to leave. So once I'm done scribbling, I then tape it using masking tape to the canvas to get it in place. And then taking a sharp pencil, I put a fair amount of pressure to get those lines to transfer. You will see once they are finished, they are very faint. And so I went over them and I also wanted to try having a bit of shading just as somewhere to start. I didn't really know how this was going to work with the painting, but I figured why not? Let's try it. This did lead to some problems while I was painting, but I will cover that in the next video. So once I finish doing this, I just seal it with a couple of coats of spray fixative. The one I'm using is by Windsor & Newton. And basically I just give it a good coating, let it dry for 15 minutes and then another one again, just following the instructions on the back of the can. And that pretty much brings us to the end. Thanks for sticking around this long if you have. If you like the video, then please do give it a like. And if you want to see more, then hit that subscribe button. Again, the PDF that accompanies this video will be available to download for free. Just check out the description box below. Until next time, bye.